Herb from Wisconsin uh, to look at a couple valuable case studies. Thank you so far. And thank you, Tommy. And um, we'll let um, the computer folks get the uh, presentation up here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is some of the root causes behind manure spills, manure incidences, but then also look at a couple of case studies and look at how a commercial manure applicator and a farmer responded to a couple of situations as well uh, that have occurred in the past couple of years. So one of the questions that we get asked quite often is, well, why do manure spills happen? And I think we can break the causes of spills and incidences down into three primary categories. One of the more common, and we'll see this in a couple of minutes, is mechanical failure of equipment or <clears throat> strictly an accident. Uh, axle breaks on a tanker, um, you lose control of the tanker on the road, a hose breaks because of wear, those kind of things are going to happen. The second cause that we see is improper application or storage, putting on the wrong amount of manure based on the fact that soils are saturated or frozen or rain is in the forecast. Um, all those kind of things fall into that improper application and storage area. This by far the smallest category is actual negligence by the livestock producer. Now there are three different studies that have been done around the upper Midwest looking at the causes of manure spills. There was one from Iowa that looked at 304 incidences, another from Ohio, and the third one here from Wisconsin. And I think one of the things when you look at the Iowa summary and look at that information there is that equipment failure accounted for about 24% of the incidences that they looked at in Iowa. Uh, storage overflow, which primarily are preventable types of things, accounted for 24%. When we look at the data from Ohio, and I give a little bit of a caveat here for the Ohio because um, Ohio's data only looks at incidents where manure was applied to cropland, does not cover manure storage uh, incidents or anything else, but they saw about 41% of their incidences occurring in the fall. And this is a um, not unexpected because, of course, a lot of our manure actually is applied in the fall, but they also looked at some other common factors as well. And excess rain saturated soil did account for almost 70% of the instances, but applicator error accounted for more than half or was a factor in half of incidences as well. In Wisconsin, we've done a lot of education trying to get farmers and commercial applicators to respond properly to manure spills. And we think this is reflected in the fact that when we look at the five-year period ending December 31st, 2009, the number of incidents we see every year continues to increase from an average of 40 reported to the regulatory agencies to 95. But we credit that to the fact that applicators and farmers realize it's better to report an incident than to be reported. <clears throat> and so we don't think that there's an increase in the number of spills, but that Farmers, commercial applicators are becoming more responsible and also trying to report incidences before neighbors do as well. And I think the key mantra that we've used is that for the most part, an accidental spill is not illegal. Failure to report it is where you start getting into trouble. So when we look at what's happened here in Wisconsin, where things have happened, about 44% on the farm. 29% are related to land application issues. Looking at what happens on the farm, most of these are preventable. Storage overflow, if the manure storage is managed properly, we're going to be able to prevent a majority of those instances. Accidents are going to happen, and you're going to see that in one of the case studies here in a couple of minutes. The two top months for overflow were August and April. And I think the interesting thing here is that August uh, was a little bit unexpected, but it was farmers waiting until uh, they felt that they could get onto fields and waiting a little bit too long to make that application, which is one of the reasons that daily monitoring of manure storage is critically vital. In terms of what happens on the road, we see operator error responsible for about half of the incidents that have occurred here in Wisconsin. So let's look at the two case studies that we have. 
Uh, the first one is a transportation incident, and you'll see an air photo of the site on the right-hand screen there. Uh, but the tractor and tanker were coming around that curve from the top down towards the bottom, merging onto State Highway 32. The tractor driver got a little bit off onto the shoulder, and because the gravel was a little bit soft, began to pull the tanker toward the side. In trying to correct that, uh, the driver lost control, and the manure tanker actually slipped. And so the photo that you're seeing here is a picture of that tanker on its side uh, actually laying on the road. And just a couple of things that I'll point out here. One is in the foreground of that photo, uh, you'll see the dam that is put there that is containing a majority of the runoff that's coming. You'll see some manure has already gone around that dam, <clears throat> continued to flow down the road ditch, down the slope. You'll also see that the uh, individuals there are up there with a snow shovel and a feed scraper trying to physically remove the solids from the highway itself. Now, one of the things that we always stress when it comes to manure incidences is the number one thing ahead of environmental damage, fish, wildlife, anything else is protecting human safety. And this goes into a couple of different areas. One, of course, is looking at when the incident occurs if the vehicle flips over, if the driver is injured, taking care of that. But another aspect of human safety is during the cleanup itself. And in this photo, you'll see that the operator is using a payloader to turn the tanker back over. Um, in this case, uh, with the chains, I probably would recommend a much wider distance between those chains and the bystanders, just in case one of those chains should happen to break. Uh, it could be a real safety issue. One of the things you'll notice here, too, with this particular um, site is that they went in and built a dam on the upstream side as well. And this is kind of unique in that uh, it's something that we see a few folks doing. The reason that this was done was they were concerned with the potential of rain in the forecast, that we would get clean water coming in the site, make the cleanup more difficult. And so in both of the case studies here, you'll see an upstream dam that was built just to keep clean water clean. Um, what's happening here is that the um, farm has brought in the local volunteer fire department, and they are power washing the solids off of the pavement. Once again, a human safety kind of thing. We want to make sure that we don't have an accident that's created later. But in the process of cleaning things up, we're not just washing that manure into a stream either. You'll see a downstream dam. You'll see we're in there with some high pressure, low volume nozzles, trying to flush the solids off of the vegetation rather than do a full excavation. Downstream, here's another photo where we've got some straw bales in there as a dam to catch some of the water and manure that's continuing to go farther down. And this is a photo taken uh, about a week later. Kind of shows what the restoration looks like. All the manure solids have been removed. We've gone in and reseeded that road ditch there so we don't have a, an erosion problem develop over the next 6 to 12 months. So the second case study that I want to look at today was a storage overflow. And this is one of those storage overflows that does not really fit into the preventable column. But in this case, the farm had just built a brand new storage and <clears throat> following the erosion control standards had spread straw on the berm to prevent erosion and to protect the new seeding of grass coming up on the side of the storage berm. We had sustained 40 mile an hour winds that blew for a couple of days. And what happened was those winds picked up some of that straw, blew it into one of the manure storages, the first stage, and into that flowed into the overflow pipe and packed in very tightly like concrete. And during the 6 a.m. check, it's a permitted operation, so once a day they checked the manure storage, they discovered that the pipe was plugged and that manure was overflowing and going into the field and into a dry stream. Now, one of the confounding factors here is that that dry stream bed becomes a wet stream because in about a quarter mile, we have seven drain tile that are adding about 10,000 gallons of clean water every eight hours. So 
once that manure hit that flowing water, it was moving much more rapidly downstream. What you'll see here is an air photo of the particular site, um, and you'll notice the photo was taken before the most recent barn and manure storage were built, but you'll see where outlined in black on the right side that concrete manure storage was that overflowed and the directions that the manure tended to flow being the uh, orange arrows there. You'll also see the red circles denoting on the left hand side where those drain tile were entering and uh, the water flow direction and also that earthen berm or that upstream dam that we put in as well. So the first thing that we did was we stopped the overflow by bypassing that plugged pipe. And immediately, I mean, we didn't have time to go in there and jet out that pipe. So we brought in a custom manure hauler with a six inch drag line and we're pumping from one pit into the next, as you see in this picture. It actually took two and a half days to get that pipe cleaned out to the point where it would flow again. The next thing that we were doing was creating a downstream dam beyond the point at which manure was flowing to keep it from going any farther. And we got the cleanup started. <clears throat> so with, once we had the initial situation dealt with, human safety was contained, the problem wasn't getting any bigger, we proceeded with that cleanup. So we built that upstream berm uh, or dam, and that really had two purposes. One was if we did get more rain, it would keep something from coming through, but also it kept manure that deposited in the field from going into that wet ditch, and then we could clean out behind that. We also built a second downstream dam uh, just as a backup in case the first one failed, uh, just to prevent any contingent or provide for any contingencies. So as we looked at it, we said, how can we reduce the volume of clean water coming in? Obviously, we built that upstream dam in case it rained. We considered plugging the drain tile, but with the volume coming through in the slope, knew that the tile would blow out fairly close to the stream and we wouldn't achieve anything. So we made sure we had enough equipment in to pump out the water and manure, and we tried to flush the manure out of the ditch Usual recommendation is if you spill 1,000 gallons, 3,000 gallons sent as a pulse down that stream will get rid of 80 to 90% of the manure solids that you're dealing with. So as we're pumping manure out of the field, out of the stream, we're consulting the farm's nutrient management plan. Obviously, we don't want to create an additional concern, so we're applying what's coming out of the spilled area in accordance with the farm's nutrient management plan. <clears throat> so once we had the situation contained, cleaned up, we went in, we removed the dams that we had put in place, and the photo here shows uh, where one of those dams had been removed, uh, reseeded the areas that we needed to, and filed the appropriate paperwork with the regulatory agency. So what have we learned in looking at these case studies and looking at what's happened in the three states where we've analyze manure incidences. I think the key thing, quick action, knowing what to do is critical. As Tommy said earlier, having that spill response plan, those phone numbers, who has what equipment, saves time, and in a lot of cases, quick action keeps a small problem from becoming the headline on the six o'clock news. <clears throat> Secondly, every employee needs to know what is in the spill plan and where copies of that plan are actually kept. Spill reporting is mandatory in most states, and a little bit later on we'll unveil a, an interactive map where you can click on your state and find out what the reporting requirements are and the hotline numbers for reporting. And consistently, but not always, we find that the penalties are less if you report the incident quickly rather than not report, or in some cases uh, the report comes not from the responsible party, but from a citizen. So just to summarize the roles of the responsible party or the person that created the incident, obviously that initial human and bystander safety, we stress that, that's important. They also should make that initial notification, the phone notification to the regulatory agency, the health department, whoever else needs to be notified, and getting that initial containment and cleanup process underway reducing the potential size of the release by 
pumping around that particular plug pipe or shutting a valve or doing something and really looking at minimizing that off-site movement. In terms of the regulatory agency and the local responders, they usually come in with a lot of resources in terms of dealing with larger situations. And a lot of times they can be useful for controlling traffic. Uh, some of the major incidents we've had with manure, one of the challenges has been people driving out to see what's going on. And so closing that road to traffic is essential in some cases and something that needs to be thought about and making sure that the site is restored as well. With that, I want to hand it off to our next presenter, Melanie Wilson from the University of Georgia, to talk a little bit about 